Greetings, men of 222. It's great to be with you today. Man, it's cold outside. It's about 15 degrees, and uh, this is a good place to be, not out there, that's for sure, because today's topic is about mature discernment, so I have enough sense not to go out, although I do have a meeting later on this evening. Too often, Christians never grow up, do they? They never become wise. That's true of society in general. Often we'll see a 50-year-old guy who acts like a 12-year-old, and he just chooses not to grow up. That's not a great way to live life. Paul gets in the grill of the Corinthians in the Bible when he says this to them. He says, I gave you milk to drink, not solid food. Why? For you were not yet able to receive it. Indeed, even now you're not yet able. Paul was saying, look, you have not grown in the faith. And I keep having to give you pablum, stuff that I would give an infant, because you won't grow up in the faith. They were still immature, not showing what the dictionary calls wisdom or careful thought. King Solomon understood how important wisdom was when he said this. He said, Give me now wisdom and knowledge that I may go out and come in before this people, for who can rule this great people of yours? God had given Solomon the task of being the king of Israel, and Solomon at least had the sense to know that it was going to be a hard job, and he needed wisdom. He needed help. So when we need wisdom, that is mature discernment, we start where? Well, the first thing we do is we ask of God. Paul told Timothy, by the way, wisdom had nothing to do with age. He said, let no one look down on your youthfulness, but rather in speech, conduct, love, faith, and purity, show yourself as an example of those who believe. Now, <clears throat> sometimes young people want to assume that they'll be, have the same wisdom that a 65-year-old man will have who's really worked at being wise and biblically studied and all those sorts of He won't. But it doesn't mean that we should disregard youth because sometimes youthful people have great ideas and understanding as how we can attack things and get it done. So what kind of example was Paul alluding to? That is to say, show yourself an example, right, of those who believe. Well, what was he saying? Well, it was the fruits of the Spirit. Paul was saying to Timothy, show people your love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. He further went on to say that against those traits, there is no law, because those are things that will mature and grow you. It will show that you are growing more and more like God all the time as you grow in the fruits of the Spirit. The biblical hero for today's lesson is Samuel, Old Testament Samuel. In 1 Samuel 8, verses 10 through 22, Samuel was asked by the people to appoint a king over them so that, why? So that they could be just like everybody else. Now, they didn't admit that. They thought there were certain advantages to having kings, but the truth was this nation had a king and this nation had a king, and they wanted a king. And so they went to Samuel and they said, appoint a king over us. And Samuel told the people, they would regret the day they did so instead of going directly to God. Have you ever read the Bible? Have you ever seen something in there that you know that you ought to obey and you haven't done it? Well, in Samuel's case, he told them how the king would exact tithes from them, how he would conscript their sons and daughters for various kinds of work, and God wouldn't listen to them when they ultimately cried out to be saved because God would be upset with them because they had said, we want a king more than we want God. Like so many with no mature discernment, discernment, they clamored for a king. And so what did God give them? He gave, gave them what they wanted. How often do we pray? How often do we ask God, oh, give me this, give me this, give me this, and he rejects. And you, and you can just tell that God doesn't want to do that. He doesn't want to do that. But we continue to hammer, and eventually God says sometimes, he says, okay, I'll give you what you want. It's not best for you, but I'll give you what you want. And just as Samuel had foretold, that's precisely what happened. But when you and I know the truth of God's word is told in the Bible and yet disobey it, why are we surprised when things fall apart on us? 
Why does that surprise us? How are you doing in that area, by the way? Are you considering the cost before you make an immature decision? One of the most insightful and directive verses in the Bible relative to wisdom comes to us in Matthew 6, 24 through 33, and it starts off this way. It says, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. Now, I, I want to stop here for a moment and make a real different kind of point than you normally hear. It's, you can make a lot of money and do wonderful things with it as long as you seek God first. You see, there's nothing wrong with money in and of itself. In fact, God probably gifted you in the first place with the ideas and the concepts and the abilities to go ahead and make that money. He just doesn't want you to make money for the sake of making money. There's nothing good about that. God doesn't need us, by the way, all in Christian ministry, but he does need us in Christian work. You don't have to be a pastor to go and share the gospel with someone. You don't have to be a missionary to go and share the gospel with someone. That's an expectation when God said, go ye therefore into all the world making disciples. He didn't, he didn't say that to just the pastors and the missionaries. When I retired, one of the worst things that happened to me was that I was no longer able to fund worthwhile Christian ministries to the degree that I wanted to. Let me say that again. When I retired, I wasn't making an income, and I was living off a fixed income. And therefore, because it wasn't that big a fixed income, when something came up that I really wanted to give to, let's say even a lot of money, I couldn't do it because I could not, it wasn't fair to my wife if I did that. I never considered that when I made the de decision to retire, what a mistake it was, what poor discernment on my part that I wouldn't be able to give to worthy causes. You just don't think like that, do you? At least I didn't. Yet as I look back, God took my decision and blessed it in spite of me, as I was able to focus on the Crusader ministry, Manhood in Action, and 222. I could not do all of that if I was still working 55 hours a week. However, the question is, when you want to retire, what are you going to do? Or do you have some ministry? Do you have something that God is calling you to? Or are you just going to sit around? And there's nothing wrong with playing golf, but there's something wrong about not living for the Lord. And Matthew goes on to say, he says, For this reason I say to you, don't be worried about your life. Boy, that's hard. As to what you will eat or what you will drink, nor for your body as to what you will put on, is not life more than food and the body more than clothing. Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father, what? Feeds them. Are you not worth much more than they? Well, of course you are. And who of you being worried can add a single hour to his life? Anxiety is not going to help you. And why are you worried about clothing? Observe how the lilies of the field grow. They don't toil, nor do they spin. Yet I say to you that not even Solomon in all his glory clothed himself like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, Will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Do not worry then, saying, What will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear for clothing? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But here's the key. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And you get all those other things anyway. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says this. It says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And don't lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, not part of them, in all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your paths straight. Part of the key to living life properly 
is to be content regardless of the circumstances you find yourself in. That's mature discernment. Paul says in Philippians 4, verse 11, Not that I speak from want, for I've learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am in. Scott Simpson, the great PGA golfer, was once asked what it felt like marching down the 18th fairway with the tournament on the line. Can you imagine that PGA big bucks? Tournament's on the line. He's ahead by one, behind by one. But they wanted to know, what's it feel like? And he said to them, he said, because he knew that he was in Christ, he could be calm. And the reporter then said, doesn't that keep you from being really competitive? And Simpson replied to him, there's a big difference between complacency and contentment. There's a big difference between complacency and contentment. Simpson could be content, but not complacent. He was calm. God would never want us to be complacent, but he would want us to be content. And the more mature we are in the Lord, we realize that we really do reap what we sow. Sometimes I think it's funny. The Bible says that you reap what you sow. And I think half the time we just don't believe that. But the truth is, the older you get, the older I get, the more I really, yeah, you do. You, you reap what you sow. And as my friend Nancy Hartsook sometimes says, sometimes we need to pray for a crop failure. Because if we reap what we sow and we're going to get that bad thing, we need, to, we need to pray for a crop failure. So as we mature, we begin to see God's faithfulness because he never fails us. Sure, we're disappointed at times, but we see God's faithfulness even in the disappointments. That's what's unreal about God. Because of this, we learn that we can place our faith fully in God. Yet it's vital to remember our faith should not be in faith but in the object of that faith, which should be God. Hopefully this story will help you see the difference. There were two guys hiking in Colorado in January, and it started to get dark, and their only hope for getting back to the lodge was to cut across the lake. One of the men was afraid the ice would not support him, and he hesitated. And his friend reminded him, he said, look, it's in the middle of January. The ice is at least six feet thick, and they had no reason to worry. The frightened man had very little faith. So he inched his way back to the lodge. The ice supported him. And even though his faith was weak, the object of his faith was strong. Well, later that same year, the two men were hiking again, and dust came upon them suddenly. And the once fearful man now said, let's go across the lake. And his friend said, hey, it's May. And the lake and the ice in the lake is only about a quarter of an inch thick. And if we do, we'll fall in. Well, he, the, the fellow that was so into it, said his faith was great. And so he said, well, let's go. And so he, he started across and he got about two yards into the ice and fell through. His faith was much stronger the second time, but the object of his faith was very weak. So our faith is only as justified as the object of our faith is strong or able. I had a young man who worked for me one time who who told me, he said, my, my, my spirit, my energy comes from this stainless steel ball that I wear around my neck. He had tremendous faith. He believed incredibly that that stainless steel ball gave him energy and power. Of course, it was nuts, but the, that's the point. The faith was strong. The object was weak. Feelings can easily fool us. It's the object of our faith that must be strong and able. Let me close with this. Sometimes you have two coaches who have coached for 20 years. One has one year of experience 20 times, while the other has 20 years of real experience. The same thing can be true of Christians. You may be a Christian for a long time, but if you don't grow and work and ask God for wisdom, you'll be the same way you were when you started. So the takeaways for this week are what we have faith in, that is the object, is far more critical than the degree of faith. Contentment is not complacency. True discernment, by the way, comes from trusting in the Lord and leaning not on your own understanding. 
Fourthly, maturity demands a willingness to put aside the immediate gratification for ultimate happiness. Let me say that one again. Maturity demands a willingness to put aside immediate gratification for the ultimate happiness. And lastly, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. See you next Saturday. Lord willing, in the creeks don't rise. Be intentional this week. Honor Jesus because he's alive.